delighted to welcome my final guest to the season finale of Luck on Sunday. And we've been trying to pin him down for some time. He's been somewhat elusive, but he is here now. And he has had a pretty glorious career as a trainer as well. After a long and glorious career as an assistant trainer to the, the legendary Jeremy Tree, from whom he took over at Beckhampton right at the turn of the decade from the 80s into the 90s. And that first season with a licence, he just won the derby and he won the French derby and he was second in the Irish derby and he's remained pretty near the top of that tree, pun intended, ever since. He is, of course, the master of Beckhampton, Roger Charlton. Roger, good morning and welcome. Good morning, Nick. I, I say you... Um, you took over at the end of a, a very successful period as an assistant. You were, you were an assistant trainer for a long time before you, um, you, you yeah. got your hands on the licence um, at Beckhampton. I've been lucky to sort of be in the right place at the right time. Um, I had a swimming pool in Lambourne and Jeremy Tree used to swim horses there. And even if they hadn't swum for three months, he's, every time it won, he said, oh, Roger Charlton trained that one for me. So he was very generous. And then when I sold the swimming pool to Nicky Henderson, um, I was at a bit of a loss as to where I was going to go, and he invited me to come to Beckhampton um, as his assistant. And he said, on the basis that I'm looking for somebody who's young to uh, find some new owners and you know in, reinvigorate the yard to a certain extent, and um, you know I won't give up until Mr. Whitney um, passes on, and he'd been ill for some time, and he'd been a huge supporter of the yard. And it was a sort of assumed that it might be two or three years, and in fact it was twelve and a half years. And a lot of my friends um, sort of said, "Well, you know, he's never going to give up, and and you're wasting your time, and all your friends are training, and you know, you need to get on with it." But it was um, a great place to be, and I was extremely lucky to have a, a, a major um, trainer to to teach me really, um, and. You know, I was really lucky to to have those horses subsequently. When you look at trainers today who are in their say early to mid twenties and they're quite impatient and impetuous and they're saying, Well it's about time I need to get out on my own and do you sometimes look at them and think, No, no, just hold on. Well, it's a brave world, isn't it? It's a tough one. Um, you know, finding finding a yard, obviously yards in Newmarket are in much demand. We've seen a few change hands recently mm. and they certainly haven't been going cheaply. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that the, the worry always is having enough horses and indeed having good horses. And um, the risk of failure is always quite high, I think, in most people's minds. You can go the wrong way, get the wrong horses, get a virus, things go badly, maybe train them badly. But it's, uh, it's a competitive sport. You need to be right up there and you need a huge amount of luck. And having the background that you had essentially dealing with horses nearer the top of the top of the tree you know the horses that were good yeah. quality well-bred animals the Whitney horses and then the the Prince Coloured Abdullah horses did you feel that was really always the road you wanted to go down you were a quality man rather than a numbers man. well I think you need to be able to train anything really um, you know if you've got something that's fast and ready to go early then you want to get on with it um, we were lucky at Beckhampton to have the support of some very good over owner breeders, particularly Judmont Farms. And, you know, their, their aim was to produce classic horses, really. Although initially we had known fact and a beer won the Queen Mary in the early days. But we were lucky, you know, Rainbow Crest was a pretty special horse. Dane Hill was phenomenal. And, you know, what a, what a contribution he's made to breeding throughout the world. Um, I think what I learnt from Jeremy Tree was patience is required, um, having a plan and, and being adaptable. The plans can change, but not to suddenly say, well, we'll run next week instead. You know, you want those horses to improve. Um, I don't like seeing horses going downhill, and you do see sometimes horses running in races that, you know, used to win group races. I, I really want to, my challenge is always to improve, and we've been lucky to have had horses that have improved. Mm. Obviously, with Hold as an example. Um, and I think ultimately we're there to make stallions, um, you know, the, to, to win races and, and market horses so that can, they either sold well or end up being stallions. I, I scarcely remember. Um, Jeremy Tree. What kind of man was he? You hear legendary tales of him. You'd have liked him. Um, 
he loved young people. Um, Andrew Balding, I think, was a godson, um, along with many others. And you know, he, he'd go to the races and always be giving him, you know, the equivalent of a fiver. It was probably ten bob note in those days. Um, he was always encouraging people. Um, I had a young family, and he was amazing with them. He was very good with them. He was a very bright man. Um, I think a lot of people thought he was quite spoilt. He came from a sort of rich family. Um, and he, he, like a lot of people, did a bit of work in the city and hated it. And then he started training, and he started training his own horses because he had inherited two or three mares. But he really minded. I mean, he never missed going out first lot. If we were at the races, he always, always wanted to get back for evening stables if it was possible. And he'd wake up some mornings and say, I had a terrible night last night, and you know, sort of, sort of pre-race nerves, um, didn't sleep at all. Whereas people sort of saw him as a sort of, um, you know, a, I don't know what, sort of large, rotund figure that, you know, smoked cigars and had the good things in life. And, you know, dare I say it, probably thought he had a silver spoon in his mouth. And it was kind of easy for him. But he was a very good trainer, a very intelligent man, trained a lot of good horses. And um, he was good to learn from. Um, you could work for a trainer and never be put in a position of making a decision. Um, he would suddenly say, we were looking at a work list, he'd say, right, you do it today. And I thought, well, I haven't sort of thought about it, I don't know what to do. But you knew after that you had to absolutely have every angle covered in case, he said, who's going to work with what, who's going to ride it, how far are they going to work, when are we going to run it, what, you know, we'd be going to Epsom and then, you know, Bellotto was running in the derby and Pat Edry was riding and he said, right, you're giving the riding instructions today, what will you say to Pat Edry? Well, you know, most assistants aren't necessarily consulted, but you have to get into the driving position. Mm. You have to make those decisions. You have to think about the decisions. You have to think about the vet. You have to think about what you tell the owner. Are you going to tell the owner that it was lame yesterday or was coughing? You know, there's a lot of gray areas in life, and you need to, you need to have that experience. And, and those challenges. It, it takes somebody of, of great magnanimity to be able to identify talent and then delegate to, to that talent rather than be a complete control freak, particularly in, in, in this environment. Do you adopt much the same policy with the people that work for you? Yes. Um, again, staff are hugely important. Um, we've got people at Beckhampton who've been there a long time. Um, my head lad actually came before me, and I think I've been there 40 years this year. And um, yeah, I think we're lucky there, and, and I think that there are lots of pressures that have been discussed on stable staff. And to have experienced people with knowledge, I think it's important to delegate. I think it's important to promote people. I think young people need promotion, jockeys as well. Uh, I'm very luckily um, aided by my son Harry, who's been with me um, several years now, and my son Tom, who's in Australia have been a huge encouragement and help. Um, and I think it's a huge, you know, I think I'm lucky. I can think of several trainers um, probably wish they had a son that were interested in what they're doing because it's not a business that you can suddenly say, right, that's it, I'm selling up, I'm going. It's not easy, you can't sell your clients. So um, to continue something that is special, particularly Beckhampton, which has now been successfully training racehorses for 200 years, and, you know, Noel Merlis and darlings and I don't know 10 derby winners it, you know it's a pretty special place I was interested in the interview that Andrew Balding gave uh, today where he said I'm the custodian of Kingsclear I don't want to be the one that messes this up Is, yeah. was there a bit of that with you when, yeah, you, when totally, you took over totally I mean I thought you know there were legends that went before me and I thought you know it's no good just having naught to 60 handicappers you know you need proper horses mm. we need to keep this place going it is very expensive to run and it runs on good horses, um, prize money um, and selling horses. Otherwise, those places don't last. And it's somewhat misleading, really, of me to introduce you as the man who had the overnight success, because, of course, you've been so instrumental in the Dane Hills and the Rainbow Quest and all these horses in the, in the years preceding it. But the, the record books will show that in your first season with a license, you trained yeah. the winner of the Derby, it's a, it's the Free Jockey Club, and you yeah. nearly got the, the yeah. triple up in the Irish Derby. Yeah. I mean, <clears throat> I felt a bit of a fraud, really. Um, Jeremy Tree. Um, told me when he was going to retire, and he'd actually been quite ill the year before he retired. And 
and you know he has sort of had a stroke and various things and um, but he handed me you know nearly three aces out of four mm. um, they were they weren't brilliant horses actually um, they were the three of them deploy Sanglemore and quest for fame were really on ratings and on gallops were within a length or so of each other. We didn't have a lead horse in those days. We had 60 horses, probably 33-year-olds, um, 15 colts. So you've got three of them out of 15. And, um, you know, when they worked, there was nothing between. One led one week and one led the next week. And um, to really win, win, win those races and nearly win an Irish Irish Derby, if it hadn't been for Sheikh Hamdan supplementing Salsipil. Very inconsiderate of him. Very inconsiderate of him. Um, and actually, I felt sorry for Barry Hills, um, you know, great trainer, and he was second with Blue Stag in this That's race. Right. For the fourth or fifth time, yeah, I think. Yeah, and you know, there's some ridiculous rookie trainer who just jumps in and, 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 and wins a race like that is, is kind of a bit unfair, I thought. And interestingly, um, the, the only two horses in that derby that actually stayed the trip were the first two. Every other horse, including, I think, was he called Dr. Brooks or Mr. Brooks? Mr. Brooks. Who was, ended up, I think, Lester Reddy or something? Ended up being and, champion sprinter. And, uh, being Mr. a Bruce. sprinter. And the rest dropped back to being mile and a quarter. And, of course, you know, the derby doesn't, you do need proper stayers. But this, this is a great race. But it was a race much more deeply embedded in the public consciousness in yeah. 1990. And there yeah. you are walking in behind him. Uh, what was going through your head at that point? Well, <clears throat> the sort of story against myself slightly is that um, Sanglemore won the Prix de Jockey Club on the Sunday. Sunday. And, you know, that was you know, kind of <laughs> a bit unexpected. Yeah, he had won the Dante, but you're not really expecting to win. So he wins and then I'm starting to read the press a little bit and I'm thinking, everyone thinking, well, you're, you're going to win the English Derby, there's nothing between them. So I got a bit sort of cranked up as I do and I thought, well, I'll go and see um, the doctor in Marlborough and people talk about having Valium, I've never had it before, I thought, I'm sure it's very suitable, I'm sure it'll keep me calm. Went and saw him and he said, no, I'm not going to give you any Valium but I'll give you some beta blockers, which I hadn't had before, I didn't know what they were, but I think they slow your heart down. And if you're a snooker player or you're giving a dodgy speech, you need a beta blocker. So on the morning of the race, I wake up at half past four, probably five o'clock, I think, a bit tense, better have a beta blocker. And to cut a long story short, I had three beta blockers before I got to Epsom. I think you're only meant to have one. <laughs> um, I then was offered a glass of champagne, which I couldn't wait to grab in the car park on the way this in. This doesn't sound like a good combination. No, it's not good. And I think probably my heart was virtually stopped. I mean, I was just so chilled out, completely relaxed. Could have been not at the races. Got the saddle on, obviously. Got to the races. Um, the horse came around Tattenham Corner, my father was there, I said, I think you're going to win. I said, no, it's not going to happen, relax. <laughs> and I promise you, I was in a trance. It's a terrible thing to say, but I was. And even when we got home, and you know, you are taken up to see Her Majesty, and I think the Queen Mother was there, and then there's a press conference, and I think Simon Crisford was a journalist, and then people saying, you know, what do you think? And, oh, well, it's all so relaxed, and, you know, it... I'm t awful thing to admit, so I'm not a druggie, as you might imagine, but um, <laughs> I was that day, and it got me, got me through a, a dodgy afternoon. You, uh, you said, that's a great story, you said that you, you know, I got cranked up as I do. You, you always give the, or quite often give the outward impression of being quite laid back. That's evidently not the case. There's obviously a lot well, going on. In, there's obviously a lot going on inside. Are you, do you habitually suffer from quite a lot of anxiety? Yeah, I think I think a lot of us do. Mm. I mean, I think you know you you develop a, a thicker skin. Yeah, I'm very sensitive to criticism. Um, I get wound up, and, and I shouldn't get wound up by getting emails from people saying, you know, you should have retired years ago. How come you got another odds on favourite beaten? You know, I kind of mind. I shouldn't, but I mind. See, those things are so outrageously rude now that they're probably slightly easier to... Yeah, ignore. I think, you know, I'm, I'm slowly <laughs> growing up now. Um, I'm maturing gently. Um, yeah, I think you have to have... I mean, you know, we have to act a bit. Mm. Um, 
you know, I'm sure when you first started presenting, before you went on air, you were probably bit more jingly jangly than you are now without a doubt and you I know think quick you, fag or you know whatever yeah. and you still you still you still need I think you still need a um, a bit of nervous energy yeah to, exactly. to, 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 to want to perform to the level that you're happy with. yes exactly and and you don't want to make a fool of yourself but I think at the races um, you know they have this thing now where you're you're on the stand and mm. you've got to run in a big race and there's a camera on you and you know, hopefully you're not picking your nose, hopefully you're not sort of doing something you shouldn't be doing, but you know, you are actually accessible to a lot of people. And I think it's good television. You see Nicky Henderson staying in the same place during the champion hurdle or whatever it is. I tend to hide a little bit um, now. Um, and I think you need to, to give an exterior off that is calm and relaxed and you're completely in control of what's going on. Inwardly, take the e-ball, doesn't take very long, there's a million pounds at stake here. Uh, suppose you had a runner in the race and you, and you were on the cold list, you hadn't had a winner for two months, and you hadn't had any good horses in your yard, and you could win 600,000 pounds. It makes a huge difference to your life, to your confidence, to everything that happens. And, you know, we're skating on ice most of the time. Most trainers who are of significant experience and have had lots of success at the highest level, they, they will normally concede that there was a given point in their career where they sort of ex not accepted their lot, but were happy with where they were at and happy with uh, the way they operate, their place in the world. I has that ever happened to you or not? I, th I think it sort of, yeah, maybe sort of Alcazim probably mm. around that sort of time, decorated night. You know, they were pretty good horses. Very and good horses you know, they got themselves where they did, but um, one got a bit more recognition, I think, as a trainer after that, you know, around that sort of period. I mean, you had an initial boost of sort of winning the derby, and some lady wrote to me and said, now you've learnt how to win the derby, how come you haven't won it again? So I thought, well, there you go. <laughs> but, um, do you know what I mean? Um, that's actually pretty, pretty brutal, isn't it? Because well, you're, being, you're being judged, you're essentially being condemned for your own success. Yeah, I mean, you know, take take Aiden. Um, he's had, you know, he's had moments this year when he might have been disappointed. But you know, if you set the bar and you have 21 or whatever it was for nominal Group One winners in a year, the next year you only have 15. People say, well, that's a bit disappointing. You know, how come it's only 15? What's the most pleasurable part of training racehorses? I what think gives you the biggest kick. Uh, the, well, apart from winning, obviously, that's that gives you a bit of a rush. Um, I think being being out with the horses, I'm I'm a better horse person than I am a people person, really. I'd rather be with the horses. I want to get to know those horses. I want to know their character. I want to know how much they're eating. I go around the horses at nine o'clock at night. I want to see what's eating. I want to get the vibes. I go around evening stables loads. I, I kind of get a sort of feeling about horses, you know, how they're looking. Uh, how they are out in the gallops. I couldn't train if I wasn't going out in the gallops. I wouldn't want to be in the office. Um, that gives me the most pleasure. And you mentioned what you brought to, to Jeremy when he was coming toward the sort of latter stages of, of his career. I'm not suggesting you're in the latter stages of your career, but what does, what does Harry bring to your operation? How do you compliment oh, each a other? A huge amount. Um, you know, new ideas, um, new people. Um, I think revitalizing the enthusiasm all the time you know we're in a place where constantly uh, there's a situation where you need a new gallop a new roof a new this or something on a house on a cottage you think well hang on that doesn't make the horses necessarily go any faster mm -hmm. but we need to spend a hundred thousand pounds doing something now if i thought we had bad horses and i thought that i wasn't still up to training i'm thinking well what's the point of spending all this money now there's every reason i want to um, you know, pass it on to him in, you know, in good shape, hopefully with some good horses. I was lucky enough to, to, to have that. And, and, and as Andrew Balding says, you're a custodian to a place with a lot of history. It would be sad if in 10 years, 20 years time, it's a golf course or a, you know, a farm. You always come over as someone with quite a modern outlook. Not someone, you're not a it was better in my day person, I don't think, no, or are you? No, 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 definitely not. I think things change and we move forwards. Um, you know, I was one of the first people to go on Twitter. 
Um, you know, you have to... You still enjoy it? Yeah, I do, actually. Um, oh, training. Twitter. Twitter. Training or both? <laughs> Twitter. Um, no, I love training. I mean, it, it, it's the same for everybody. It's, it's about having good horses, really. I mean, I, I feel very sorry for lots of trainers who are, you know, training small numbers of horses and they're running at Southall and no disrespect to Southall but you know in naught 60 naught 55 races and you know those horses win one race in 10 and it's a tough tough game mm. you know owners owners want more all the time and it's all right they might think it's all right for Charlton he swans around and you know he has nice horses and he's got good owners um, it's very competitive um, and and we need you know, it's no good being second or third. We need to have winners is what it's all about. Um, owners, everything. It's winning, winning, winning is, is the only thing that counts. But your methodology and the way you have a, a feel for it and you want to be a more in instinctive trainer is not necessarily compatible with just trading winner after winner after winner after winner after winner. No. I mean, you know, all horses are handicappers when they start, really, and, and um, you know, you need to try and win two races rather than one race with these and horses. In, in all that time, uh, who, who have you most admired amongst your, your peers? Who do you look at and think, mm, they seem to have this pretty well nailed? Well, <clears throat> I've been lucky enough to spend a lot of time with Luca Kamani, um, who we know is a, a legend. Um, and, you know, he's got a very good brain. He talks a lot of sense. I learn things from him. Um, Henry Cecil, you, everybody respected. Um, he was hungry, Henry. Um, and he'd probably trample on you to get a horse off you, but a great trainer. And actually, when you got him on his own and, and he was being sort of normal, um, he used to give good advice. Um, when I started training, he said, just remember, there can only be one boss. Don't have a committee. And, and we've seen situations where perhaps horses have been trained by a committee that hasn't really worked. Um, Sir Michael Stout, I like, I like his sort of method, methodology. I think his patience with horses, improving horses, presenting horses at the races in, in proper races is to be hugely admired. I think Mark Johnson runs a phenomenal operation. I mean, it's, I've never been there. I'd love to go there. I think it's absolutely exceptional. Um, there are lots of people. You know, people have their own, own parts. Um, you know, when, you, when you're in a 0-65 at Bath and and Mark Prescott's got a runner in there, you think, <laughs> why do I turn up? Because that exhibits how many different um, ways there are to get the job done yeah. and, and how many different sure. methods there are. Yeah. Fundamentally, people yeah. think, oh, it's easy, you just get these animals fit and you just run them in the right races. Well, yeah. if it was that easy, we'd all be having a go at it. Yeah, exactly. No, agreed. Has there been, has there been one result for you that's been particularly significant latterly? that you've taken particular satisfaction from? Um, I don't know. Um, I think, I think built bringing al back, having been to start winning a Group 1, was a good result. Um, he was a horse very close to your heart, wasn't he? Yeah, he was a, he was a good horse, a seriously good horse, a beautiful looking horse and a very tough horse. And, and um, yeah, he was good. I mean, I think Cityscape looked pretty good when he won in Dubai. You know, I think it was great for James. You know, I love, um, you know, the sort of young jockey idea, if you like. I mean, you know, James was, I guess, probably a bit depressed when he first came to me, and it just happened, really. Um, he'd been in Dubai, and, and um, Cityscape went out there, I think, four or five days before the race, and, and I thought, well, you know, I need a jockey. And, you know, James had the ride and I just said, you know, get out there, you know how to ride him and the way it went and course record. And it was a big prize that. I think I went missing for a few hours after the race. <laughs> but apart from that, <laughs> it, was, it was a good day. <laughs> Dare I ask where? Well, I don't know. I got sort of a few drinks and then I got somewhere there was a sort of bit of a building site. There was a whole, you know, Maidan wasn't really finished then and I got on the wrong side of the barrier somehow. I don't know. Got a bit lost somewhere. Anyone who saw Roger Charlton in the hours after Cityscape won the uh, Dubai Turf, you know, well, you have on to kind of celebrate somehow, don't you? Yeah, absolutely. Answers on a postcard, please. I know you're going to stay with us. I want to talk to you a bit more after the break about um, nurturing young talent.